welcome to another episode of Artful TV. I am Eileen Imperatris, and with my co-host Hal Rains, we are welcoming Hi, guys. a great landscape painter, David Spencer, is our special guest mm -hmm. artist today that we'll be talking to in our third segment. But first up, let's hear from Hal and take a look at his newest video of a pottery piece that he's working on now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the pieces that I'm working on at this point are, uh, interestingly enough, not using underglaze this time. Uh, the pieces I'm working on again later, I'll come back to underglaze because you guys know I love this stuff. And so um, that being said, it's a 3D piece that's, you know, you can see I'm chomping away the pieces layer at a time. So that being said, let's go. Hi everybody, it's Hal Rains. Welcome to Artful TV. It's exciting to get to spend another period of time with you when I get to talk about my favorite stuff pottery. I know you'll find this hard to imagine, but I didn't even touch underglaze this time. Instead, I chose to sketch, then carve and burnish. I burnished a lot. There are tools that are like erasers that are great for sketching in clay, but I like skewers. I mean, you can easily rub over the top of it if you don't like what you've got there. And that, my friend, takes us to loop tools. You see, when I'm working with uh, the tools like this, the loop tools, and you see I'm going around the patterns, realistically, um, I'm turning this into a 3D design. So all the little swirlies and the boxes and whatever, you have to carve away layers. That's how you get the shapes you need. That is a burnishing tool right there. Well, the burnisher is an interesting tool because it allows you to smooth the edges, compress the clay, and it polishes the edges as well. This next little tool is simply a modeling tool. It's sort of like really thin spoon where it just digs and gets into little cracks and crevices. And remember guys, this is a 3D piece. So you have to remove layers, lots and lots and lots of layers. This is another type of a loop tool. I mean, if there are curves, believe me, there is a tool made to fit it. Remember last time we had Amy Cole? She's a sculptor. A lot of her tools are very much the same. In fact, many of the tools have the same names. It just has the difference between the type of steel or the type of carbide size overall that makes the determination for the price. There is a finite thickness and even though this is a bowl, it's still relatively thin. Possibility of carving through everything that you're working on. It's odd that you'll spend about as much time burnishing as you do anything else. Because remember, you want to make that clay tough. Okay, so this is where the fun really begins. I finished the sketching, already peeling back layers, doing some burnishing. You can start to see the shapes coming together. You can see the 3D stuff going on with some of the vining and some of the packaging and the diamonding. Oh yeah, this is where it gets really good for me. This is a sweet spot. This is one of my very favorite tools. I mean, it gets into everything. You can see the little shovel end of it. It's really pointy and it does a fantastic job peeling back those layers. You can see it just gets in the little cracks. It's just it's like the perfect tool for sculpting. It's kind of like scrub, 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 scrape, 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 brush, 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 polish some more, and then you start to shape. Oh, you really get nice shapes coming. Okay, note the nut picker. Yes, really, it is. It is, and I'm using it for burnishing. Scratch. Scrape, shape, shape, shape. Okay, say it with me, scratch, scrape, Shape, shape, shape. You might be thinking, oh my God, how long did this take? Well, 
Let me tell you, this was a three hour process. It was right at three hours from me um, basically starting when I sketched it out with the skewer sticks to actually when I was able to stop it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just know that that's my thing. You really can't compare yourself and your work to other people. I mean, biblically, you know, the, the Bible calls us a fool if we do that, but we kind of do that anyway, don't we? We do that. I wish we didn't, but I think everybody does. I guess the point is to say your work is your work. If it takes you 10 minutes or 10 hours, it's your work, it's your thing. So that's all you can ask. Okay, there's no grand discourse here. Just we're talking over pottery, all right? So I'm just about finished. You can tell that the shapes are really coming together. I still have to use this particular modeling tool to round the edges and carve the depths of the vines that I need. And that is it. Thanks for taking a clay journey with me today. Bye-bye. Woohoo, right? Clay! <laughs> That's great. So, you know, I was thinking about well, while you. you're working on the process and you said about how long it takes to do it for you. It took you three out, three and a half hours or whatever to do that particular piece. You're working consecutively then in your studio on that one piece. Has there ever been a situation where you work on something for a little while, but then maybe you come back later on and decide you want to do more or maybe you need to step away for some reason? Can you do that effectively? Do you need to wet the pottery back down to be able to continue to sculpt or how does that work? Well, that's a really good question, and there's really absolutely no easy, easy answer unless you uh, cover it really tightly. That's the thing you want to do. You know, a lot of people use old refrigerators, discarded refrigerators, because they seal, and so um, it holds all the moisture in. Uh, so that's the biggest thing. You want to just make sure that things um, slowly eliminate their water so they become bone dry. And once they become bone dry, unless you use some kind of a power tool, you know, it's going to be really easy, like a Dremel with small bits, you, you're you pretty much done. Once it gets bone yeah. dry, it's, you know, just got to move on. So, and actually when you throw the piece, you have to let it get leather hard before you can start working with it or it'll collapse. So yeah. that took whatever time it took to throw it, then I had to let it get, you know, tough enough to handle, you know, being handled and um, we'll carve from there. So thank you for asking the question. So. Well, I'm impressed with all the intricate detail you do on those. It's really amazing and beautiful, of course. Well, thanks. Thank you. So that being said, I love to get into your work. And I know this time you've got, well, you always do have personal pieces, but this time um, I think with that one particular chair, uh, well, the one that's in a dark room, uh, the the um, well, I'll let you take care of that. That's your piece. <laughs> okay. So that right. being said, Eileen, take it away. Yeah, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but we'll go through the ones that I'm I'm providing today. I've got five pieces that I'm sharing from the series that I did in 2011 called Reliquy, and uh, these five pieces again, you know, my work is very personal, so it's dealing with whatever I have to express at the moment, and um, things that I'm thinking about in general that. I've either gone through or that, you know, I'm expressing as a way as a universal concept. So let's go into the first piece here. This one's called childhood, and this is definitely extremely personal. This is my memory or my memory, I should say, remembrances of what I grew up as a child. We had some horses in our uh, yard. You know, we had a farm that I grew up on, so we had horses. And then I remember uh, playing with frogs around the little pond with my brothers. And then, of course, we had Easter egg hunts and a lot of other things. So all of those little line drawings that you see that look sort of like a chalkboard are more reminiscent of the childhood that was, you know, the fun stuff that were things that we did. And then the other segment, which you see I've broken things up into three uh, areas on this particular canvas, even though the second two areas are together joined, you still see a line in the center of it. But that's more of like mm -hmm. a background of uh, some of the difficulties in, 
you know, abstract things that were going on also when I was a child. And there's a little stencil cut out of a teddy bear that belongs to my aunt who had passed away uh, just before I started working on this series. And so I used some of her materials. Uh, you see threads that are hanging from the hand that's above the horse, and those are some of her threads. And then that stencil is something that she had used to make little teddy bears for various members of the family. So I wanted to honor her by using some of her things in my work. Uh, but again, it's about the idea of uh, growing out of childhood and the innocence lost and things going on, you know, that uh, then cause you to grow up. So that was what this piece called Childhood was really reflecting on all of those things that I went through growing through my childhood. Then the next piece we yeah. have is called Femininityism. And it's deliberately joining the words of femininity and ism because there's a lot of isms that go along with being a female in this world good and bad. And what I was really reflecting on in this piece was some of the things that are expected of women. And I know there's a little bit of a glare on some of those ads that I brought out from magazines, but it's all about how women have to look a certain way and we have to, you know, keep the kitchen clean and stuff. And some of those ideas have kind of uh, outdated, thank goodness, <laughs> that we are allowed to be a little more ourselves, our true selves. And I know that yeah, men also goodness. have some things yeah, that are also put on them to be um, expected. But I think in general, women, you know, are having to fight through some of these stereotypes that are given upon us and uh, some of the old ways that we grew up with, and then just trying to find the new form of ourselves and what we can do uh, in the newer times. Did do you, you remember question, how well it's not even a few years? I'm sorry, a few years back, remember, well, gosh, it's more than that now, but I mean, a man was never supposed to cry. Never, never, never. Right. And now you see yeah. people on so many things, you see these guys that are blubbering, you think, okay, we can be a little tougher than this. <laughs> so I don't know, you know there's a, a fine line to walk, I guess, but we just have to do what feels right for us at the time. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I think I'm glad the you're end speaking result is that. Exactly. I think the end result is that we can't fit in any particular general form that everybody's the same way. It's just not, that's not possible. Yeah. And thank goodness it's right. not because we're all different people and it's what adds to the diversity of the world and makes it fun and interesting. So, so yeah. yeah, I think everybody gets those things put on us at different times and we grow up with different expectations, but then we have to figure out how to break out of that mold and be truer to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that comment. Yeah. Okay. And then the uh, next piece is called inequality and dealing with some, not all of them, but some of the things that I feel are issues that are definitely still things that we need to deal with. I've got, you know, the little figures in the center where the man is paid more than the woman. <laughs> that shows a distribution of, of how things are in the working world. And then, of course, there's the issue of people working in the fields on the far right under the sun, you know, being treated not much more than like slaves, basically, and working really hard labor. And then there's the tombstone that lies between that figure on the hill and between the people in the military helmets and boots working towards what they think is hopefully going to give them a college education on a lot of cases. But then sometimes it and most of the times it ends up in not getting to do anything because they perish in the wars that they're fighting. And I've even got a little mm -hmm. cage with an animal in it because there's a lot of situations where animal cruelty is still going on and things of that nature. So it's it's looking at various things that are still unequal in the world and trying to hope that we come to a point where uh, things are better. Now, the very center around the little um, cross looking symbol in the center is two rings. And at the time, of course, when I made this, we were still fighting for equality of people being able to marry uh, no matter uh, what they were and who they were. And so thankfully, that has changed significantly uh, that now that mm -hmm. people of the same sex are able to marry. So that's at least uh, gotten a little better. Uh, there's still people that have to deal with discrimination against that, but at least things are working towards uh, resolving some of that. Right. So then the next piece we have is called Laws of Attraction. And this again was dealing with some of the darker issues that I've had to deal with uh, growing up and looking for the freedom. In the upper right hand corner are deliberately some wings that are on a bird that is flying out of the canvas. A friend of mine who is an author, a very successful author, 
had taken this photo many years ago, uh, obviously before 2011, and it was of this bird that was in flight and he only managed to get the tail end of it as it was leaving the view of his camera. And I just thought it was so poetic because it was the flight of the bird just going on with its life. And so even in all the darkness of things that I've encountered in my life and, and ways that people have tried to use authority over me to get things out of me, I still see that myself as the bird flying out of that and reaching to a higher level of doing things for myself and achieving things in my life that allow me to escape the negative things. So, so that's what this is about. And then the final piece that I'm sharing today is called Propaganda. And this is dealing with something that I think we are still obviously dealing with every day in the way politics have uh, gone, especially, but even just in general, a lot of different things out there that we are fed propaganda about. Uh, and you see that even more in some other countries in the world where whole societies are being kept in place by the propaganda that they're fed. And we, of course, in America have seen plenty of that through the years and are still seeing some of that where we have to deal with figuring out how to step out of what we're being fed that we know is not right. And so you've got different symbols within this imagery that are the podium and then the skull in the far lower right that uh, is, you know, captions that are filled with negative thoughts and nothing of value. And then uh, there's that TV that's on the string leading above the person trying to balance himself and, you know, the snake-like hand pointing at you, telling you what to do. It's just all these things that we deal with on a daily basis on how do we figure out what is the right thing for us as human beings to, to keep our earth alive, to keep ourselves alive and everything like that. One of the things I'd like to point out with this series is that the last three you saw that were very similar because they're all the same size and uh, kind of framed the same way, there's that big circle that's in the center uh, of the piece and then also the little um, cross-like symbol that's also in the center. These were images that came out of something that I just saw as I was driving along one day. And I was, I think, stopped at a stoplight and I happened to look out my window and there was, a, I guess, a manhole cover for maybe the sewer systems or something like that. And it was that shape, of course, and then a little marker in the center and it must have said some words on it but i just was so struck in that moment by the circular shape of that and how it was a rough texture and everything that i knew i wanted to include that in some artwork and so this was how i did it i just used that feeling of of the roughness and then the whole look to the canvas you know that there's some black coming through and purposely um left out in certain areas and then just the rough texture of the paint itself as i applied it it was the feeling of all the things that were going on at that time and just trying to reconcile how we make imagery out of things that happen and things that are rough around us. So it's, it's, it's all that feeling that I, that I have going into it. So these are five pieces that I chose just from the series that uh, there were more from the series, others that sold and others that I've shown in previous shows. And so this is just you know giving you a good sample of what I was thinking of in my headspace at the time in 2011 and why I created this work. Yeah, well, I really like that. I, I, I recognize the cross in the three pieces, but I hadn't realized that you had the circles as well throughout the three. So that's so good to talk to an artist and see what, you know, what their process looked like. So you Thank have you. an idea what caught them and took them on a specific journey that evolved into their work. So I always yeah. love that. It's, it, okay. I know it's very helpful for me to, to do the art and it's very cathartic to be able to work through different things that I'm dealing with in my own emotions and my head, you know, just needing to get out and put into the artwork. And that's why it's so cathartic for artists to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Okay. So our guest today is David Spencer. Eileen's already mentioned that. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that he was a teacher for 28 years, just like me. He is a really talented guy, just like Eileen. <laughs> he does uh, landscape portraiture, unlike both of us. So that being said, I will <laughs> give it to you, David. Thanks for being with oh, us today. Oh. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just one general comment about Eileen's work. I noticed uh, it seemed like a plus sign in the middle. And as an elementary yeah. school teacher, I thought of everything kind of being added and combined together. But, uh, uh, I, I've you. always uh, been drawn in by her work because it has such simple images, but it has such a deep uh, emotional concept underneath. And uh, be interested in um, talking about developing concepts maybe sometime. But uh, I'd like to share some about myself here, since this is my my moment um, here. I. Um, was a very quiet child, uh, always uh, more the right brain than the left, uh, left-handed. And uh, the one way I got attention in school was by uh, showing a drawing ability. And uh, it uh, helped a lot with my self-esteem, especially when I got into difficult years of uh, teenage years. Uh, in junior high, I, I became my uh, the cartoonist for the school paper and the staff artist. And then in high school, I did the same. and. During high school, I even mailed off some cartoons to a magazine called Datebook and sold where they, they sent me not a lot of money, but it was like $15 a cartoon. And boy, I felt great. I felt like a professional. <laughs> and, um, oh, yeah. Followed that through, uh, through college uh, where I got a degree in art from Fresno State and had some very uh, very good teachers there. Some not so good, I wouldn't mention, but uh, I think you get that at any school. Uh, but yeah. uh, around near the end, I got sidetracked by by music. I, I think I was looking to come out of myself a little more and be a performer. And uh, I also spent time in theater. I acted in plays, which was uh, kind of challenging my quiet nature. It takes a lot of your energy to be a teacher. And um, it was I was just did leftover work. And I first tried painting um, when I was in my late 40s. And um, that um, didn't do it. Too, I might do a painting and then not do a painting for a couple of months. But when I retired, I felt a need to do regular uh, something creative. So I bought a bunch of canvases at Allard's. I get them five for twenty dollars, you know, and I've got the cheapest paint. And I started first. I did some called. Um, they, uh, let's see, what did I call them? Um, they were. Um, um, Oh, impressionistic snapshots that I, I took uh, family portraits and things like that. And I did um, influenced by Monet, but I discovered that I liked doing the backgrounds. So I started doing uh, just plain landscapes. And here's one of the first ones here. I spent maybe three days on it. Uh, this one here, the downtown library, I spent a little more time. And I found that by capturing more of the detail, I uh, got a, a little bit more of a, a magic out of it. And I, I worked here a lot on um, getting uh, the, the shine on things. In fact, I use an awful lot of white. Uh, this one here is uh, Galaxy 500, which I have a sentimental attachment to. Uh, I own one from 1980 to 1990, and it was a good car. Uh, and this one I saw was parked on Maroa for about 10 years. And I took a picture of it and did a painting of it. And um, that was one of my first sales uh, when I started exhibiting at Sorensen's. And um, this one here, um, a very familiar building. And I know Fresno really well because I, I've walked a lot from one end to the other. Every time I worked, I, I would walk six miles to work and uh, I know the landscape very well and certain things stuck out. And this is a very unique building on Fruit Street uh, that I um, noticed a lot. And uh, I think lately it's a, a place called Lucy's. And, uh, but this was one of my, uh, my first sales also. Uh, and I worked a lot on the detail. Uh, this was kind of a found moment. I, I just uh, happened to have a, a camera at the time when the bus pulls up and and the gentleman in the wheelchair is getting on. And um, and this was one of my, my first sales also. And um, I was lucky after I'd been doing these for a while, I, I didn't really, wasn't sure what to do with them. And I had them all over my house and I, all my friends got one and uh, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to move into sales, but um, 
I ran into uh, Amy Cole on a substituting job. She was working at, I think, Greenberg School, and she told me about Sorensen's. So I joined Sorensen's gallery, and um, through Sorensen's gallery, the first time, very first time I exhibited there, I, I sold about eight paintings. And, and I walk out with about $1,000 of cash in my pocket, and I thought, oh, boy, this is fun, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah. this one here is, is one of downtown, and I thought it um, makes a good combination of what our downtown is, which is a lot of um, empty space and uh, very prominent buildings. And, um, you know, I spent an awful lot of time on that field, just getting the, um, the texture right uh, on the field. And I go through a lot of brushes, too, uh, and it's all acrylic. Uh, but a lot of times I use an almost dry brush uh, to get it just right. And I've gone from the first ones I only spent about three days on to uh, this one here, probably about three weeks. And uh, even lately, I've, I've been, it's been more like closer to a month because I, I just, the hardest thing is to decide when they're done. And, um, oh, this one here was uh, uh, just another thing I drove by on Blackstone probably countless number of times. And um, it just, I, I had to do it. You know, it was just perfect. Paradise. And uh, for those of you that know the building, they, they pretty much sell, um, yeah. are known for selling liquor, of course, and uh, also a, a certain type of uh, magazine that... Uh, is not at most literature stores, you know, and, <laughs> and the fact of it being paradise, I thought yeah. was unusual. Um, here um, uh, is on Venice Boulevard, uh, a very uh, noticeable station. And this was one of my most popular on Facebook, which is, uh, Facebook's been good to me. I, I take pictures and post them there. And even during the pandemic with Art Hop being shut down, I managed to sell uh, five different pictures. And it's, there's a long history behind it. it uh, those, you know, the area. And this one here, uh, the wonderful um, uh, Tower Theater uh, that the district's named after. And um, the the big challenge on this was to capture the um of course the ceiling and the floor and uh, this last one here is uh, a very uh, well-known um, establishment um, if you've gone down olive toward roding park until about uh, five years ago well those are amazing david yeah, well, i mean really the, the oh, detail well, you so that much. you get in there I'm just really impressed with the amount of detail. I know it's definitely more impression, impressionistic and that's the choice that you're making to have your work. And I think it's wonderful for that because then it's not so, you know, down to the Nats eye detail that people then feel like it's a picture, but then it's enough of a picture representation that people obviously immediately identify what it is. Appreciate <laughs> the intensity with which you look at the pieces and also love the detail, especially the Tower Theater that you caught the, I don't know, just the, oh, it, it's like the picture's singing. You know, it's just beautiful. So, uh -oh, thanks. well, David, I appreciate you being with us. Eileen, it's always a joy to see you. Um, now that we can yeah, talk yeah. together without masks, hopefully we'll be able to get together. Um, I think Sorensen's is open. I know there are several galleries that'll be open for Art Hop this time. So I look forward to seeing you again, Eileen. Much love, be safe. Tell Tony hi. <laughs> Take care.